I look at my phone, it's 2 o'clock. Make sure my phone is off. And we're just, uh, Council, we're just uh, checking out from a uh, webcasting perspective. We've had some issues with the webcast. As you know, last week it wasn't working. They think they've rectified it. They've asked us to record but not broadcast. So we're hoping for this to be recorded today and then put online as an archive later tonight, assuming everything goes according to plan. So that's where we're heading. So officially, I'd like to call this meeting to order, Special Committee of the Whole meeting uh, for Monday, October 28th. Um, we do not have any supplementary agenda. And uh, pecuniary interests, I believe there may be a potential pecuniary interest, depending. <laughs> Councillor Jaglitz. Uh, thank you. Um, I've been advised that I might have a pecuniary interest if uh, during the conversation any discussion comes up regarding touchstone mist or the villas and i would just request if if for some reason that topic comes up or is it possible to leave it till the end of the meeting so i can participate and tell them and then i would have to leave thank you okay thanks so again for council i mean again we're surely talking today about uh, the steering committee's recommendations regarding minette um, so I'm going to try and keep us on that topic, obviously, as much as we can, without uh, having to venture down to Lake Muskoka. Let's keep this on Lake Rosso. So, um, so we're now invited delegations. We don't have any. I see Mr. Weirs has joined us. In case uh, we have any technical questions, thank you for coming on this beautiful last day of fall. I think the snow is coming later, um, and we'll move on to uh, items of business discussion regarding the uh, Minette Steering Committee. And I'll turn, I think Mr. Pink wanted to sort of introduce this or where we left off last time or how do you want to proceed? Happy, uh, thank you, Chair, uh, Your Worship. I'm happy to uh, provide some background to committee members, although I think you're uh, likely aware uh, of most of what's occurred. Uh, in May 2018, uh, Council did pass an interim control bylaw uh, for the resort village of Minette. Uh, prohibiting additional development while we review uh, existing policies uh, and ensure they're aligned with the communities and council's vision for development moving forward. Uh, shortly thereafter, a steering committee uh, was uh, convened with uh, broad and various uh, backgrounds and uh, expertise, and they've been meeting uh, regularly now uh, since the fall of 2018 uh, to go over uh, proposed policy directions and as I'm sure you likely recall did uh, they've produced a number of reports to council um, however uh, on Wednesday the 16th I believe it was of October they did present to council the first uh, report that included proposed policy directions I believe you have a hard copy uh, in front of you and if you prefer to view it that way I do have um, the uh, proposed policy directions in chart form on the screen as well, uh, and I believe it was in your October 16th Council agenda packages. Um, they are laid out in largely as the current official plan is, or a typical official plan would be, with the various sections and topics in the left-hand uh, column, and proposed policy directions uh, on the right. And I think the ultimate goal um, uh, wasn't available to be present at the October Council meeting, uh, I believe at the Planning Committee meeting it was felt perhaps a separate day to devote just to this topic was necessary, hence why we're here today. I'm happy to answer questions as we go through uh, the chart, but I leave it, I guess, to Committee or the Chair as to how you wish to uh, work through this. Um, but ultimately, the uh, Council did extend the interim control ballot for additional year uh, earlier this year. It does expire, uh, I believe it's May 17th of 2020, and ultimately the goal um, Last, um, and approved by the district prior to that time. So again, uh, happy to work through the chart as, as you see you wish and facilitate the discussion and or answer any questions that committee members have. But I believe the goal is ultimately to try to reach consensus on a number of these. And you may wish to discuss um, you know, directing staff to produce a report that would include uh, draft official plan policies. We could then after that um, consensus and agreement is reached, we could advertise for a public meeting on a potential new official plan uh, policies for Minette. Okay, thank you, David. Um, I'm actually going to turn to Chair of Planning and uh, just kind of get your comments as where you would want to go in this. And again, we talked about doing this originally in a planning meeting. 
um, but to get all of council here we're at a special cal meeting so um, I'll get your sort of input as to how we may want to move our way forward uh, either going through item by item here um, and then I think we need to discuss as council sort of pros and cons of advancing official plan amendments uh, what are the risks of doing that what are the not risks of doing that uh, what happens if nothing happened comes May what do we anticipate happening and uh, I think that's something that council can all weigh in on. So I'll look to yourself, Chair. Friedman. Thank you. Thank you, um, Mayor Harding. Um, yes, so the, the idea behind this is to keep all of our options open going forward in terms of when that interim control bylaw comes off. And one of our main, one of our objectives here, and this, is, this comes from planning, is it's a fairly, as, as Mr. Pink had told us from the beginning, there's some fairly tight timelines here. So we felt, uh, I felt that it was uh, necessary to have this meeting now with all of council here so that we're all up to speed on this. And my suggestion would be, um, Chair, that I, I am assuming, as we always do, that everybody has read through these and had a look at them. And so there are only a few that I actually would like to talk about in any kind of depth. The rest I'm actually quite comfortable with is in terms of a framework for, for a draft OPA. And so I might suggest that we open it up to council and see um, who else might want to discuss certain things. I mean, I certainly would, my sort of main, main hits are whether we leave it as an urban center, which means it has to develop like a, a Port Carling or a Bala. The next concern would be, do we have public or private waste management facilities? I think we need to look at the residential loading here. Um, and I know at the last, at our council meeting, uh, we talked about the docking and the boat study. And I believe that staff was going to bring us back um, uh, something on that 582 foot dock and I think the other thing for me anyway is what do we do about that corridor in terms of Peninsula Road going up to to where Manette is because it's beautiful and historic and okay I'm, I'm gonna leave it as neutral at this moment but I think we need to have a look at what that is so those are my my items and any perhaps we get a list from everybody what they want to talk about and then we can talk about it that would be right, my so suggestion appreciate that I, I mean I think there's uh, some weighty stuff in those few comments um, I'll ask is there anything specific that somebody else that, that wouldn't necessarily be caught in those sort of catch-alls uh, at this particular time that if we decide to weigh in on do we want um, and I'll, I'll turn to the uh, director of planning in a second here but keeping, if, if I got your notes correctly, sort of do we want this to be an urban core or not? Um, you want to talk about uh, public or private services and how the village is serviced. Um, there's a residential component or is it a tourist, tourist component? I'm assuming that's based on accommodation. Uh, we want to talk about the dock and then also the uh, infrastructure, if you will, highways leading to and from would sort of be the five categories that you outlined. Is there anything specifically, and we'll parse those out of here, is there anything else specifically that anyone would want to flag today just for a general discussion? Um, your, your ultimate goal was to sort of potentially think about crafting an OPA and we'll leave that um, as we work our way through some of these discussion points if that's fair. Anyone else want to comment at this point or we can, Councillor Jagowitz. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to actually, as, as Vice Chair of Planning, I'd like to follow on to the lead in uh, uh, from the Chair of Planning. And um, I have some comments and they're complimentary and, and, and I, I wonder if you just might uh, give me a minute or two. As many of you may be aware, I attended four of the last meetings of the Manette Steering Committee and as such gained an insight into their collective thinking. Although this is an interim report, it is quite final in all but a few areas where they're waiting for final reports and have not reached a consensus. In my view, the interim report is the proper starting point in drafting an OPA, and the draft can be updated with any major changes that come in the final report. Uh, the interim report was set up to follow the sections of our current official plan, and, in, and is quite detailed, and we might get lost in the woods if we take that approach. So what I've done is, I, I've prepared a discussion paper, it's a one-page document, 
uh, uh, to deal with six of the most important areas that we as council need to come to consensus on. And they mirror what the, what the chair, had, or chair planning has indicated. I believe that we, we should discuss each one of these today and in addition, any areas in the proposed directions that we have a major disagreement with. With this information and the steering committee's report, staff should have enough to draft an OPA for our next meeting. There are more steering committee meetings scheduled and the draft OPA can be updated for any major changes. Uh, I, if it's okay with the committee, I'd like to distribute just this one page. It's kind of a working document that we can all doodle on if, if you wish. And, and if, if I may, I'd just like briefly to touch on my view on those six points. I, uh, I, won't, I won't be late. So if, if I may, I think just from a trying to work our way through this process, um, and I appreciate your six points, and if they mirror similar um, to what Councilor Bridgman has suggested, then that's awesome. Um, but I think let's try and tackle them individually. I mean, if, if one of them is an urban center, or a resort village let's stop there for a moment okay. and if we can kind of dig down a little bit to sort of understand where we want to go um, and uh, I, I want to be careful and I think uh, our director of planning will always remind remind me of this that our job as council is to evaluate the work of staff and what a steering committee is recommending and say yes or no but being careful not to create our own decisive decision where we want to go so we can agree with or disagree we can put some information on the table and then with such a further public meeting uh, that would be happening so um, David maybe if you want to sort of chime in a little bit maybe you can direct us to any comments that the steering committee may have made specifically from a reference and those people in the public uh, regarding some I'll call it resort village versus special policy area versus urban area so on and so forth and we'll deal with that one first if I may um, I can say length, uh, and then did uh, toss the ball back and forth as to whether uh, you know to define uh, Manette as a resort village or a special uh, policy area, uh, and maybe to provide a bit of background on how I guess the terminology came to be um, might be helpful for committee in, in moving forward. I I don't put. Um, personally too much weight or concern on number one I think number two or um, the water and wastewater services whether that's a municipally managed and operated and owned system or a private communal system largely dictates what I think the answer to number one is um, so Manette historically and always has been in uh, both district and township official plans has been identified I think originally uh, many 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 years ago as a hamlet uh, it has always been identified as some uh, settlement um, and for the last many years as a unserviced community so the same as Milford Bay um, the same as Foots Bay, Windermere, uh, Torrance uh, and the others in the municipality the only service communities we have uh, are uh, Ballon Port Curling when Ken Fowler Enterprises made their application to uh, redesignate Manette uh, again the main um, uh, item up for debate was whether the community should be serviced by municipal or private services and it was never envisioned as a new growth center it was never needed uh, it was never identified in any growth strategies that uh, a new large residential component uh, was envisioned for Manette this wasn't your typical urban center like Ballon Port Curling uh, it was never envisioned to have that uh, municipal infrastructure institutional uses like schools uh, health care etc so it was clearly historically a resort community a community built around a number of historical resorts and that was the vision going forward so I believe what council chose and uh, through the application with Ken Fowler Enterprises instead of identifying it in our current framework in our official plan which was urban centers again Ballon Port Carling or communities uh, which was the other unserviced impression that this was not a residential community um, but a community with a character of resorts and predominantly resort use 
but yet serviced by municipal water and sewer services. So that's the background. Um, and I think what the steering committee has been debating is perhaps an easier solution to the uh, recommendations is to simply turn back the clock and go back to Minette being an unserviced community such as Milford Bay, Windermere, Foots Bay, uh, Torrance, etc. are currently. And certainly much simpler when it comes to drafting policy. It would simply be referred to as um, it would revert to the existing policies we have in our official plan for those communities. Um, so, but they did, um, as I say, uh, go back and forth on that a number of occasions. I'm sure Scott can attest to that. Um, and ultimately decided to continue with the district wording, which is just a special policy area. And that is, uh, like I say, a function of how the district official plan uh, is set up um, versus uh, how our plan is. So I don't know if that's uh, helpful or provides a bit of background. Um, Hopefully it is helpful to your, uh, to your discussions. As I say to me, what you call it is less important as ultimately the big question number two is how is it serviced? Um, is this going to be a municipal uh, owned and run facility uh, or is this the private communal services? Uh, again, what you call it a number one is of less uh, uh, concern to me. Um, again, hopefully that helps uh, facilitate some discussion. Council, any comments on that? Again, I, I, Councilor Jagowitz, I mean, I'm trying to read through yours here at the same time in tandem with what uh, Councilor Bridgman did. Um, are these your recommendations going forward, you know, that we refer, we officially call it in our own official plan as a D1 special policy area? Um, let me just help to understand your perspective as it balances Councilor Bridgman's, if I may. Uh, thank you for that question. And, and yes, the, these are my thoughts. Uh, I have, I have, uh, consulted with other people, but they are basically my thoughts. The reason I thought number one was important, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, was that it, it sends a message. It uh, sends a message that this is not a, uh, in, our, in our official plan, C is urban, D is, is community. By making it C1, you kind of say it's more like urban. And, and I believe that the way the district have done it is more proper, they just called a special project area or a special policy area and assigned rules to it. Therefore, it could be serviced or not serviced. Number two, the servicing part, this is extremely important, I, and I agree with the Director of Planning on that regard. And I've listened in to a lot. And, okay, and if I, I can, just, I, want, I want to come back to this first question. I just, we're going to try, we're not, I don't want to get into servicing at this point. No, but I thought you were doing one and two together because that's Well, I, I still want to look at number one. What, what okay. our director of planning has suggested is that number two probably will dictate number one, but I want to just see where council's perspective is sure. as we work our way through some order. Council Bridgman. Um, I'm in agreement with what the steering committee uh, said in the end that the same wording as the district's official plan makes sense to me and it leaves open that private or public which we're going to get to in number two so it just seems to me it dovetails better and takes the concern of the net becoming a big urban center by those who don't read the fine print out of the equation so that's my thought Can someone help me I'm just trying to see where the I where Manette Steering Committee actually recommended to call it a D1 special area. I know the district has sort of suggested that, but I'm, David, maybe you can point me to the chapter and verse, if you will, in our large document. As you can see, it's the very first uh, row of the proposed policy recommendations. It's not perhaps explicit, but you'll see Manette will exist as a tourist and recreation focused special policy area. And that's that recommendation that they did discuss at length and had some iterations uh, throughout those discussions and ultimately fell on special policy area versus what was originally I think termed a resort village in the earlier discussions. So just a conversation with their CIO so that that's a significant change theoretically to this area if I'm not mistaken, because um, no residential component would exist in that. Is that correct? I'm, I'm seeing a nod from Mr. Weirs in this. I kind of got that whisper in my ear from our CIO. Uh, I'll look to our Director of Planning first of all, and then I can go to Councillor Jagowitz. Do you want to chime in on this, or Derek? So, Mr. Chair, I, 
the, the, the comment was to ensure there's clarity around every in everybody's mind with respect to what this is saying is it will be a sort of a tourist residential community as is planned now previously it was a community where other types of uses like industrial etc albeit at a lesser scale because of the private services was previously permitted so this is predominantly going forward a tourist commercial slash residential area as opposed to anything else is what I believe so okay so maybe, yeah, I, I may so so it's interesting that we're sitting here trying to determine what this first point states um, without language around it and is it a recommendation to remain as it has been for the last 10 years or is it to go back to 15, 20 years ago? And, and maybe let me ask that question specifically, if I may. I'm not sure, David, if you can answer that or if I need Mr. Weirs to answer that. Because it, I, I don't have, I see language, but as it is, or as it was, could, over 10 years is as it was. Um, help me. I think ultimately the committee determined not to go back to the community, simply the community policies of uh, what would be 10 plus years ago but to keep it in the current uh, special policy area under the district uh, using the district terminology there as I said there was certainly discussion uh, about simply just reverting to the community policies of right. 10 plus years ago uh, this direction would not uh, go down that road but to continue to identify it as a special policy area okay so if I may just in Phil speak if okay I'm not a planner the idea is we would leave the, the committee's recommending to turn your phones off. Um, <laughs> the committee didn't recommend that? <laughs> it's the chair's job. I see Mr. Weir is reaching for his phone. <laughs> but the committee is recommending what I'll call a status quo, if I can use that term, for the policies in and around Manette today that exist today. Is that true or there, there a change? Well, I think certainly as you work through the document, there's a number of changes that are proposed. So I wouldn't necessarily call it a status quo, but I believe uh, Committee Member Jagowitz probably rightly summarized. Um, they felt to remove the focus uh, as a resort village, more of an urban uh, perhaps feel or connotation to it, uh, just to simply call it a special policy area, but not. Um, I think, again, that's not, certainly I understand the desire to go uh, line by or item by item and not jump ahead but as you can see there's a number of larger questions that have I wouldn't say be fully answered by the committee at this time such as density permitted uses in particular and servicing private or, or public and uh, I think that's why they've left it as a special policy area for now uh, as they haven't fallen on really answering the other uh, large questions that we have uh, later so um, okay um I'll go to Councillor Shakar and then Councillor Jaguar. Thank you. Um, my concern, and again, sitting around the table when we did deal with uh, the Marriott and a lot of these policies were put in place, that we had borders. And I don't see a border kind of document with what I've received, anyhow. Um, my concern is that where we just blanket changes that affects many many people that have had historic businesses for years for instance and now the zoning on their properties changed we saw that in downtown Bala um, if, when just saying now everybody's commercial so if you want to add something to your residential use you got to pay to to do that I'm I'm just really concerned where this is going because I I, I was so hammered out for I'm going to say a few years of what those borders were going to be when it came to a tourism resort community if you want to call it that and I'm just a little concerned about that we're just now calling Manette we're going to blanketly call Manette something that it necessarily uh, we're, we're not I hope we're not making changes to other property uses that have already been um, having in place and there's two properties in particular that I'm concerned about because certainly they do not fit into a resort uh, maybe a contractor's yard but but um, 
this would be really damaging to them. Right. Councilor Jaglitz. Uh, thank you. Um, <clears throat> The committee um, has spent a lot of time on these issues, and I would say on some of these subjects, they've not fully landed on one position or the other, and that's where, where you may find it confusing. I think the one-page document I handed you is worthy of some merit, because there's been a lot of thought put into the words, okay? And it's meant to be a discussion paper to take the key concepts here, and so we, as the, uh, we give some direction to staff in the, with the big picture. There's a lot of details in there about, like for example, you talk about that, like if you'll notice when it talks about, it talks about the resort area. Well, there are residential areas within Manette also. So we're just trying to give the, 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 the concept of it. And um, so I know, you, I know you don't wanna go down and, and read each paragraph and then get a discussion on whether you agree or disagree, but that may be one approach. Uh, but as, Dave, as, as the Director of Planning has done, they all kind of tie into each other uh, somewhat. And uh, I just think there's six main points that this thing is talking about that I think are worthy of discussion. And, and again, we're, we're going to talk about six main points. I don't have an issue with that. I'm just trying to understand. And what I'm hearing and trying to let counsel as we move forward here, and, and I think the steering committee's probably got it right. They don't have a technical term is it C1 Resort Village? Is it a D1 Special Policy Area? They haven't, because they haven't answered all the other questions yet at this particular point. So I'm not sure, can we answer that without having landed the plane, so to speak, in all of the other areas? Um, it becomes a little bit moot. And ultimately, at the end of the day, when I think when we put an official plan amendment together, we should have the language appropriate and proper to better clarify what else is going on in the village. I, I don't know. I'll, I'll go to um, Councilor Kelly first. Uh, thank you. Through you, um, w maybe just a suggestion, since it seems to me that uh, the form here follows the function, uh, the number one issue, which is how we identify it and what we call it, if we dropped it till the end and resolved all the other issues, we may find that the appropriate nomenclature comes out of our discussions above. Barb, you want to comment? Well, just quickly, I, I mean, nothing's set in stone even if we started an OPA. So I, I want to reemphasize that. So we may not have all the answers, but there's a process that takes a long time. And I'm cognizant as an elected official that that we make sure that we're that our process is in place so that by the time of, uh, at the end of the interim control bylaw, we have something. And I think my other thing is I don't help me out. Um, Please, Mr. Pink, changing the designation from from uh, Minette Resort Village to um, special whatever the special um, policy area doesn't change any of the zoning. I'm having some trouble understanding Councillor Nishikawa's concern because I don't see that changing what people can do in it if you're just changing that designation. So please help me, David. Thank you. Um, so simply changing the name from Resort Village to Special Policy Area does not necessarily change the zone or may not even necessarily change the permitted uses, but keep in mind um, that if an official plan amendment is approved and if that official plan amendment does make changes um, to those permitted uses, densities, et cetera, um, under the Planning Act, uh, our zoning bylaws are required to be in conformity with that official plan. So uh, it will take time, but that will be the next step. If, uh, if a new policies are put in place, um, the zoning will have to follow suit. Now what the municipality did as, by, as part of bylaw 2014-14 is put a hold on the majority of Manette, uh, in particular the, uh, the, air, the current service area, not the future service area. Um, and that hold uh, can only be lifted once a number of uh, matters are addressed, one of which is a comprehensive zoning bylaw being approved by council. So it sort of put it in the hands of the stakeholders to make that application and bring the zoning into compliance based on the policies. I'm gonna stay high level 
uh, and think about the larger issues, you do need to put your mind towards implementation and all these changes will have potentially implications down the road when you consider zoning and you have to consider how you're going to actually implement these directions. Some things are difficult, some things are easier. Um, but I think you're already sort of identifying the issues that uh, Mr. Weers and I have uh, been experiencing with the steering committee. Everything's very related in planning and we talk about one and realize how related the others are. And then when we get into the other, you'll start seeing how they all relate to one another. Um, and it's becoming a bit of a circular debate sometimes at the committee um, when they realize uh, if they tweak one, what that does now to the others that they just landed on. Um, so it is, um, it is an interesting exercise. So okay. hopefully that answers your question about the zoning. And so it does. I, I think, I, I, as your point, and Mr. Councillor Jagowitz as well, they become interrelated, and as you want to go down your list. But so if we may, let's park the title at this particular point and keep moving our way through, and we may fall back on that or we may not fall back on that. But I think the next point Councillor Bridgman brought up, rightly so, is, is this a serviced community? Or is it a private community? And um, uh, Councillor Jagowitz has written some language um, that really, I don't think it really says serviced or not, just says no development or redevelopment until the MOE chimes in. But I'm not sure where the steering committee specifically landed on, and I don't think they did land on, is it a service community or an unserviced community? Right now, the redevelopment of Manette if I'm not mistaken, that can, nothing can be developed until it becomes a service community. So the master plan says you're putting in a public system to manage this. Otherwise, you're not developing to the density of which the uh, resort village of Manette has been provided. Councillor Jagowitz. You don't even need to raise your hand. I know you're going to go. <laughs> I assume that's okay with everyone. <laughs> Um, before I answer that, I'd just like to comment generally on something that was said earlier, and that is there's really uh, uh, three groups here. There's council. We set policy, okay? There's the steering committee that advises us, okay? But that, they, they don't tell us what to do. They give us their best advice. And then there's staff who have to implement it and put it into words that can be interpreted and used. And I'm not at all trying to do the staff's job. I think that's a huge mistake. I was trying to just... David's got this document in detail. We need to give him some guidance on these major points so he knows how to start. Now, when he brings it, if we don't like it, we can change it. So having, having said that. Can I just make one quick comment sure. before we go on there? And I think and I'm going to ask our director of planning, and I see some planners in the room as well. Um, we, though we will help set policy, we will utilize staff to confirm what's been said in this Manette Steering Committee. Is it right? Is it wrong? And understand bigger implications from a policy direction perspective. Because in some respects, this Manette Steering Committee has dealt with their own little vacuum. In a plank sheet of paper, here's what we'd like to do. Here's understanding this, everything else. But that does not necessarily, and I'm not sure whether scope included the overall Township Muskoka Lakes and the District of Muskoka and some of the higher level things that I think our planning staff would have an opinion on, right, wrong, indifferent along the way. And David, maybe you can comment on that because I, I, w I don't, I'm concerned about us taking a steering committee's recommendation, ourselves chiming in and saying go away staff and make this happen because we employ staff here at Muskoka Lakes to truly make the recommendations to us to add, subtract, or divide. David, maybe you can comment, and then I'll go back to Councillor Jagowitz. Um, certainly, I think what uh, you're referring to, and uh, certainly committee may wish to discuss, these are recommendations. Um, you're both correct that you, know, you will direct staff as to what uh, those directions you have consensus on, and we can uh, simply ensure that at a future meeting there is a draft official plan that you can chew on. The other part of that is, um, do you wish for staff or any planners opinion on the appropriateness of those? Those are two very different things. Um, again, any planner can draft policy. Uh, whether they agree with it or not is another question, and that's a question for yourselves to ask whether you uh, wish that feedback uh, or not. 
Okay, so everybody kind of get that in your high level? Councilor Jaglis, yeah, sorry to interrupt. I, I certainly agree with the Director of Planning. We want that feedback. We're not at all trying to do that. We're just trying to get the process started so you have a starting point, okay? If we recommend something that's not appropriate, uh, you tell us and we, we'll, we'll, we'll certainly listen. I have no problem with that. So, so let me finish mm -hmm. what I was saying on the, on the water and wastewater. Yes, you are correct. It does not say public or private services because like on everything else, the policies further down will determine if that's appropriate or not. In other words, if this is going to proceed, and I'll just give an example, with a high component of residential, then it requires municipal services because you can't have multi-unit drawings on private services. If it proceeds with no residential component other than staff housing in the resort area, then it can be done on private services. So as Director of Planning says, they're all interrelated, but they were all thought out how they interrelate. And I'm not saying these are the answers, but they're the discussion points. Councilor Bridgman. Um, I just have a question on that, actually, and I guess it will be to you, um, Mr. Pink, again. Is it possible to, because I guess I'll tell you where I'm, I'm sitting at the moment, is private services, because if we force this area to be on public services, the cost to put it in has to be, has to be covered by far more units than what, what the developer would need to cover their costs. So massive difference. I think it's, what is it, 20 million to put in a, a commercial one and maybe 2 million to put in a private one? I'm guessing. Anyway, it's a huge difference. So that, but but then I'm going to ask you, if if we said, um, you know, private facility and they put in and something's put in to govern all of the commercial <laughs> units there, a big facility. When we put residential in there, can they not still just be on their same, their, on on an individual septic system? So can we not do both in this area? So that's my question, Mr. Pink. David? I think you could do both on the, on the private side. So currently the way the district official plan is set up, you could have private communal systems for the resort commercial uses, uh, but then you would have to have individual septic systems on each residential zone property. The building code requires that each um, property is serviced by its own system on its own property. But there are policies and through the condominium process that gives leverage for the district to ensure their interests are addressed uh, and we do allow private communal systems for resort commercial uses only. So it, you could go that way on the private side. Of course, uh, the public side would allow both as well. Anyone else want to comment, Councillor Shikawa? Again, I'd still like to see the map what we're talking about because some of the discussions are really centered around the resorts, but Manette is bigger than the resorts. So that's where I'm having my challenges, but also remi remembering that the way that um, sewer and water is set up um, through the district in Bala and Port Carling, it's expected that you hook up. And some people are fined if you don't hook up. And that's what I don't understand what we're... I don't understand the borders of our discussions when we're talking about private and and public and actually how um, how this all plays out. I mean, if it, if it was meant that everybody would hook up to the system, that's a different discussion. Okay, so I guess let me come back to. Sorry, who else? One? Oh, there's a map. That's in the official plan right now. That's correct. correct. So, but our steering committee hasn't made any recommendations, any changes. They haven't made any recommendations saying should we be on private or, or public uh, services at this particular point. I think, uh, to, if I may, through the chair, uh, to address Councillor Nishikawa's question. I don't think the borders have not been proposed to change, although the committee has yet to do the the mapping part of their. Mandate. I think that's scheduled for a future meeting to look. I don't suspect or there's been no talk of changing the boundaries. That is in the current plan. That's what the insurance control bylaw applies to. And that's, there hasn't been any talk of changing it. But I believe what's being referred to, as you can see, the yellow is residential. The uh, hatched uh, red is uh, resort commercial. 
and the cross-hatched red is a village core, and then the green is uh, environmental protection areas, and the wavy blue is the institutional or the municipal water and sewer services. So certainly changing those designations is possible, and that's a future uh, steering committee meeting. Um, and again, ultimately changing those designations, depending on what uses ultimately are permitted under those, may very well have implications in zoning and property owners' rights. That's how the planning framework is set. Um, I think to answer your last question, I don't believe the committee has fully decided or fallen on the servicing question. They put in sort of interim type wording under servicing that allows some flexibility currently um, to contemplate both, but I believe they're still chewing on that ultimate question of whether the community is serviced or not. It's obviously a significant question that they struggle with, as it has consequences, certainly, depending on which one uh, is chosen. Um, I would have to consult either colleagues or legal counsel. I'm not aware of an official plan off the top of my head that would contemplate both municipal and, and private. I think you do have to ultimately choose one or the other. I, like I say, I suppose anything is possible, but I'm not aware of any plans that would identify a community that could have both. Um, I think you are or you're not. That question has to be answered, in my opinion, and it hasn't been by the committee yet. I think they were aware that this had to come in front of you, and they left themselves some flexible wording that it could still go both ways. Um, but ultimately, I believe the intention is for them to make a final decision and recommendation to you on that question. But that may have to come in December. Councillor Zavitz. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so just for optics, um, I sat in the audience two years ago when the ICBL was walked on for Manette, and then I sat in the audience and watched where it was established that there would be a steering committee. And now I find myself, you know, I'm a fairly bright guy, but I, I'm scratching my head wondering, we're talking about an interim report, which isn't even, so it's not finalized, it's not the final document. Uh, smarter people than I are sitting on that committee to make recommendations. And I, I just wonder, when, when the uh, steering committee was established and the idea of it before it even was established, to where we are today, where <laughs> now we're down from, I believe the report was 100 and initially there was like 125 concepts and thoughts banded around down to distilled to 29. Now we've got it distilled down to six, which you know, I get it. And you're right, these are the salient points. But my point is, you know, are, are we even in a position to have this dialogue yet? I mean, if, we're, if I'm expected to make a decision on what I am seeing and hearing and, I, you know, intelligent dialogue back and forth, I'm not sure that the recommendation, like, are we to make the recommendations or is the steering committee and others going to recommend to council what, here's what you should do. I'm finding that it's council distilling these these down to say this is what we should do and I don't even think we the committee's established what they haven't got all their answers yet and so I, I again optics is my thought Councillor Kelly uh, just further to that thank you very uh, mr. chair just further to that I'm, I don't think we're trying to distill down to six I think we're trying to take their draft proposed amendments uh, and make them sort of subject to six different thoughts or different uh, considerations which is what I believe Councillor Jagowitz circulated earlier Councillor uh, I'm gonna to go to David first of all and then I'll come back to Councillor Mazan certainly Rob. thank you uh, through the chair I just thought it might be helpful maybe I can provide a bit of background as to the intentions or the timelines uh, as I mentioned the ultimate goal of the interim control bylaw is that at its conclusion in May of 2020 there are new official plan policies in place. And the reason for that is if the stakeholders, any stakeholder in the community makes a zoning application or even a simple minor variance, we wish to review that application against policies that are aligned with your vision and the community's vision, which perhaps may not be the same policies that are in place right now. So ultimately your uh, uh, right member, uh, Zavitz, this is an interim recommendation. I think there's some urgency with time, as, um, as the chair noted and staff noted at the very beginning uh, of this process, the timelines were always extremely optimistic. Uh, we're going to be very difficult to meet. And I think we're seeing that now as we're nearing up the, the two year conclusion. And there's some, there was some desire to have at least interim recommendations in front of you um, so that you don't get the sort of the first and final report in January, February with very limited time left to turn that around for May. Um, 
so ultimately it would have been preferred if these were final recommendations. Unfortunately, there's a number of studies, two studies that are being completed um, where they can't finalize some of these recommendations just yet. Um, but again, just very high level on the process, the intention is this steering committee, its sole mandate in the terms of reference and only authority it has is to make recommendations to you. You as a council ultimately will decide what policies or directions you agree with, what you don't. You will presumably direct staff to prepare an official plan amendment, which we then have to turn around and go through the planning process. So there's that uh, notice period prior to a public meeting, the holding of a public meeting, and ultimately what complicates it if your recommendations propose changes to the district of Muskoka official plan, which it certainly seems like we're getting there, um, we need to do that lockstep with the district of Muskoka. They're the approval body for our official plans, and it seems like they have to amend their official plan, and we need to somehow do that before May. So I think that was the desire to get this in front of you in October versus for the first time in January, because we presumed you might have lengthy discussions like today and have some back and forth, and if we do that till March, it's likely too late. Um, so very tight timelines. Um, I think, if I can speak for Member Jagowitz, I think the intention of this is we largely agree with the vast majority in the chart. These are the six remaining high-level big questions. I personally would add a few more, and I can do that at the end of today's meeting if we have time. Um, and uh, if we can answer these questions, then at least staff has clear direction, and I can come back to you with an official plan uh, policies, uh, hopefully for December. Okay. Uh, Councilor Mazan, first of all, and then I'll go to Councilor Roberts in a few minutes. Still. Thank you. I think David just really nicely said the question I have sitting here today was what is going to be the ask at the end of today, and if it is to ask for a staff report to come back to us in November that helps the cascading events happen so we are prepared for May 17th, and that's an ask that I can get my head around. And then there's a second, so that's process and timing. But then the second part, which I, I'm trying to listen to understand, is the content, right? Which is, so I, I, I'm separating, and I'm just, I think that that's what you're saying too, David, is there's, what do we need to give direction to staff to today, and, or do we agree with that? And the second then is, let's now talk about the content of the actual um, recommendations and start getting into the meat, which is what I think Councillor Jagowitz and Ms. Uh, Barb Bridgman, Councillor Bridgman, sorry, Barb, brought up as well. So I think David just said what I was asking. Councillor Edwards. Um, just to uh, David, to the chair, uh, to get this uh, official plan amendment enforced by May the 16th, one day before the interim control bylaw goes off, how long do we have because you have, we have to have public meetings and everything else with that so when do we uh, come up with this so that we can get something in place by by May the 16th David. so I'd like to give you a clear answer and I can give you sort of very clear dates but unfortunately it's a very difficult question to answer one predominantly because whether the district of Muskoka uh, needs to amend their official plan as well and typically keep in mind an official plan amendment of this magnitude if you go back to the KFE application, took several years, many public meetings, a lot of discourse. If, you know, if we just purely the process, if you're comfortable with official plan policies, we need to advertise in the paper or a mailing to affected individuals a minimum of 20 days prior. And potentially at that public meeting, you can uh, adopt the policies if you choose to disregard all the submissions you may have heard at that meeting. Typically what would happen is, of course, coming back to a committee or council and digesting those submissions and addressing the concerns. And that's the unknown. We don't know what will come out at that public meeting, whether the community or the impacted stakeholders, what their comments may be. And then, of course, tying it into our meeting cycles. We need to keep in mind, of course, we could uh, schedule special meetings if needed to expedite this. But again, if the district of Muskoka needs to amend their official plan, I don't know their appetite to do the same. So we need to. So again, it's going to be a range. I think you really need to be started uh, really January at the absolute latest to work and have any possibility of, uh, of approving this by May, and that would be a very expedited process. Um, just to give you a rough um, ballpark, but again, the, the unknowns are what comes out at a public meeting, uh, and also, uh, again, the district's uh, involvement in their um, ability to move efficiently through the process. Okay, I'm going to um, Councillor Zavitz first of all. 
Thank you, Chair. In the interest of context, again, for me personally, so I, I understand what the ICBL is. May 16th, 17th. Um, we seem deathly afraid of that date. We're, we're driving headlong towards May, and it's October. Uh, not to be flippant about it, what, what is so tragic about what's going to happen at the end of the ICBL? David? The short answer is really nothing. Um, but the concern is that if the policies are not amended, um, then I guess you could determine in some way that the municipality may be somewhat exposed and that an application may be made for rezoning that you don't find favorable. Uh, however, the policies will be as you see them written today, which may be favorable um, for the applicant. So the difficulty is essentially nothing happens after that date. Um, however, um, it's a very public process to amend the official plan. And if a shrewd stakeholder did not like what's coming down the pipe, so to speak, and the writing on the wall of what new official plan policies you may put in place, a shrewd stakeholder would make an application to secure their development rights through a rezoning application. Um, and that's the risk or exposure uh, to the municipality. You have this shelter until May. Um, that's the advantage of the interim control pilot. Just to keep going down that road, though, even though we put in an OPA, the developer also has the right to appeal that decision. And then, as such, it's sort of the decision comes not around this table necessarily, or a little more discussion it ends up at LPAT theoretically to determine what is right or what is wrong at that point. That is absolutely correct. The interim control bylaw doesn't shelter you from a, a potential appeal to a new official plan amendment, so that is a possibility. Councillor Bridgman. Um, just a couple of points. At, at that date that you said seems to be due day, it isn't just zoning. My, my understanding is, as, as the chart or the map you just saw, the developer can ask to develop those 4,000 units because as it stands now, the developer has the right to do it. Am I not correct? David? I think that's largely, again, try not to get to, too technical, but that's largely the same thing as what I was trying to get across. You're right, the, um, if that date comes and passes, there's still a hold on a large portion of Manette and they still require rezoning to be approved by council before they can get building permits. However, if that application is made, it is subjected to the policies in effect at that time that the application is made. So if it's submitted on my desk and it's deemed complete on June 1st, and we have a new official plan policies in place June 2nd, we will have to review that zoning application in accordance with the June 1st policies, which again may not be aligned with your vision or the community's vision of what's appropriate in Manad. David, a technical question. An application and deemed complete are two different things because we've gone through an application two years ago that was not deemed complete, but we've put an ICBL in and now changing policy. So hypothetically, on the 17th of May, a developer says, here's my application. In all fairness, it's probably not going to be complete on the 17th of May, let's be honest here. And it takes a few weeks or a month or whatever, and it's a new developer. We know it's a new developer. We're going to have some different changes and different plans. And then we put an OPA in on June 1st before it's deemed complete. What policies are we looking to? I believe in my opinion, it's when it's, uh, when it's deemed complete. The policies in effect at that time, I believe, is what the tribunals determined in previous cases. Although what you're sort of setting up is essentially this race, <laughs> um, which that's hence the difficulty we're in or the situation. Right, which is either we're in a race or we're not in a race and like, do we race at that point or not? Um, you know, and, and uh, as we talk around this again, I'm, I'm, I, I struggle a little bit as I look at some of these things and water waste or no development, they're not official plan policies. And you know, we're, the steering committee still hasn't put their stake in saying everything they want, and I agree with that. Um, and we're still doing some more information, and, and our staff haven't chimed in as exactly everything we want in all of this. I, I, I get the deadline, and I get where we're going, but we're setting a policy 
for the next 50 years. We're setting a policy to design what Manette is going to look like because we're saying what council did just 10 years ago isn't good enough. It needs to change. And yet we're sitting here somewhat racing to a finish line, potentially in the next 30, 60, 90 days, to write all these policies based on what we feel. And, and I'm, I'll be honest with you, I'm a little <coughs> uncomfortable with that. Uh, I'm at the will of council, obviously. Um, Phil, go with your feelings. I, <laughs> I am the first person to say we need to protect water quality. We need to protect Lake Rosso. We need to protect the village of Minette. But I, personally, I want to have a vision a little further down the road and not reactionary, more proactive. And I think I, I also don't want to discount all the work that our steering committee is doing and is continuing to do, and there's give and take, and I don't want to take power away from or, or, or knowledge out of our staff to just execute our comments. But Councillor Jaglet, want to comment? Uh, thank you. Um, I guess, I guess um, <clears throat> I've, I've heard some of the, the uh, arguments for slowing down this process and missing the deadline. And basically, I can't, I can't really understand them because we're a council, We've been talking about this for a year. Uh, the, 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 this is not a new subject. We know what the, we've always known what the deadlines were. Uh, there's nothing wrong with us having a discussion here, giving uh, staff some direction to come back with a draft, getting the process lined up so there's a possibility of it being done by May. And if the steering committee comes in with some different proposals or new facts come in, we can always amend it and we can always not pass it. Okay, but to just say oh, well, it looks too tough, I don't understand it, I haven't spent a lot of time analyzing it, let's just put it off till another day. I don't think that's what we were elected for. I think Councillor Hayes would like to comment on that. Thank you. <laughs> um, I think everybody read the report and digested it. Uh, my ask from the committee, I, I guess I'm viewing it a little bit different, was they had one uh, ask that they wanted to be addressed right away. Fine. Um, the rest were proposed policies, and they were asking for our comments on them. I felt that they were saying, are we going the right way? Are we going in the direction that you feel is going to support what you feel Manette should look like? Um, and if they weren't going that way, then we were to comment on them so we could bring them back to a to a, some place where we would be comfortable with. So when the final policies come forward, we would be able to endorse them. And I have gone through them, and I'm sure everybody on this committee has gone through them. Um, and I didn't see anything that was too off base. The only question I had was the same one that Councillor Nishikawa had, is what exactly are the borders? Are they going to affect anybody new? Are there any surprises? So um, I'm quite comfortable with in, in going ahead and saying it looks like the committee is going in the right direction and is doing a good job. Um, and I have great confidence in Mr. Pink that when this policy gets to fruition, he will be able to very quickly bring it to our uh, table as an OPA. Councilor Mazan. Thank you, through you. Again, I, I think I'm, I'm maybe getting caught up on the timing piece, and I'm, I've been trying to follow you, David, and I'm wondering, do we have anywhere, like a laid out visual representation of, like, you're the subject, it's a project timeline that gets us to, I think it was May 16th, as Councillor Edwards said, so that it helps us when we're making these decisions. Like there must be a key milestones and then embedded in each one of those I would suspect that you would have 15 other activities that you're working on. Thank you. Uh, so we do have a flow chart that we forwarded to uh, the steering committee. You know, I can try to bring it up on the screen if I can find it. That does lay out sort of working backwards. But again, it, it's difficult to answer because it will largely depend on meeting cycles. And again, the normal process, we'd have a public meeting in the middle of summer uh, and perhaps a lot of debate after. There's certainly no time for that anymore, um, but I can uh, bring up the timeline here. I hope it's the right one, and then I will, uh, I can certainly forward it to committee 
uh, after the meeting if you wish to review it. Do you want to say that right now? I think you're just pulling it up. I mean, that's fine. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Shikawa. I don't have the timeline in the back of my mind at all. I have the policies and the words on paper that we may or may not pass that I'm trying to look at. And again, thank you, uh, again, identifying, are we just talking about where the resorts are? Or are we talking about others and all of those sort of things? That's what I'm concerned about. Um, I just think that we would just keep working away at this, but we're working not to discuss what the timelines are, but actually t the policy or the, the um, things that this committee had asked for. Anyone else? Councilor Bridgman. Okay, so I was elected, this is a huge hot button issue in my area because I'm there. And in terms of this process, there's no final decisions being made. I, I'm not trying to usurp the committee here at all. I'm just trying to make sure that we have enough time to get an OPA in, in place. Should we decide to do that? That isn't even a given. Like, these are just options. And I, I don't intend to have to stand there and, and uh, defend myself to my constituents that I did nothing to, to, to try to help this along to make sure that we hit a deadline. And, and all due respect to, to Mr. Pink, I know he'll try his hardest. I know that. We've got the district to deal with. I want to buffer back this direction to the absolute what needs to be done from January on. So that's just what I'm, I'm trying to say. And maybe I, one more thing. I'm not looking to, to take Manette and do massive changes to it. We have a developer there who's, who I want to see successful. And so we need to work on something that is going to work with our developer too. So we don't have, we don't have him come back and, um, and appeal it. So that's also in my, in the background for me. Thank you. Uh, I think we're just trying to get in focus on getting that up. Okay. <laughs> He's trying to find it. He's searching through vacation photos right now and uh, somewhere in there. <laughs> Councillor Savitz. Thank you. Through you, Chair. Just for the record, I'm not in the in any way trying to impede any process on set. In fact, I support this, this moving this through and showing our support for Manette and for our township. So I certainly would support this and, and moving it through today. Okay. I think the uh, timeline's kind of up there as we see it, Councilor Shikawa. So, I mean, the issue, I think, as David commented, that sometimes it can go quickly, sometimes it takes more as we chime back in. Uh, and if we think about it just for our own perspective, we have planning applications come to us regularly. We defer public comment. We send them back for 30 days. And I think that's where the timing may change. And that's just ourselves dealing with it. Then it goes to the district. Does it fit and match into a district cycle? And how does that work? And is there special district meetings and so on and so forth to get forward? And, and in fairness, I'll say, if it got passed in June, it might be okay as well. I, 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 the sky's not falling come May 17th. And every discussion we've had, um, you know, going forward, they're not in here with development plans and zoning applications and everything else at this particular time. If they were, and David's working, evaluating, are they complete, then absolutely we got to rush forward. So, um, Councillor Jagwitz. <laughs> Just a quick comment. It's really off topic. Uh, I, when I first moved up here in 1987, this council was considering 8787, the uh, bylaw, which uh, would no longer allow multiple cottages on a property. I bought my property in, in uh, 87, and that didn't get passed till 89. I found, about it, found out about it in 88, and the first thing I did is filed an application for two cottages so I wouldn't be covered by it. So I don't think we should... Uh, uh, I think people out there, and I'm not talking about maybe the developer you're thinking of, but there are other places out there too that may be doing something. So I really think we should, and, and by the way, Councillor Zavitz and Councillor Hayes, I was certainly not, uh, I apologize if I, some reflection. I'm just getting a little frustrated. I'd like to get this moving along as I know everybody else would, and I'd like to work with our staff. And I, I think we should at some point have some direction to staff to come back with a report advising us of their opinion on it and at the same time a draft OPA. And I think that should be the end game today. 
so CAO and I are working on a little resolution very much to that perspective and to get uh, things working in, in, in round terms, just crafting some language as we speak here. But, you know, one of them um, is to have our staff report back specifically on the recommendations in contemplation of an OPA. And then I think specifically asking some yes or no questions, if you will, to us where we really have to chime in on to help provide that added direction. I think as Councillor Hayes says, I don't think there's anything in this that's contrary to our belief or feelings as we're moving forward. So, um, you know, to Mr. Weir's, I mean, our, our steering committee's headed in the right direction. So thank you for that and uh, helping support that go forward. And to Councillor Bridger, how do we, how do we support this? Um, Again, I, I'm just cautious. We don't want to rush, and, and haste makes waste. And maybe there's some other bigger things. Typically, you know, if I go back to the original rezoning, the developer kind of came in here and said, "Here, here's what I'm thinking. Here's some ideas. How can we make this kind of stuff happen?" We're sitting here now saying, "We're doing this almost as a block to say we don't want to do this, and we don't want to do this, and we don't want to." Maybe the developer's got some unique ideas. This council hasn't been presented ideas, and some very high-level stuff. I know Councillor Jagowitz saw. Um, but really not very definitive as to what is going to happen at the end of the day in that. And uh, that may change certain zonings and policies and everything else in the official plan as to where they want to go. So I would hate to jam an official plan amendment that somewhat handcuffs them that we can't get the development we want at the end of the day. So I think they kind of have to work together moving forward in something along this way. But... Um, just working on some language. Uh, let me, uh, I'll go to Alan first of all. Uh, the thing is, is, it's policy now. An official plan amendment can be made, and at another time, another official plan amendment can be made. It's not tying us in for 50 years or 100 years. Another council could, could uh, take changes. So if we do go with something, we have to, to tweak it. It can always be tweaked. And that so if we uh, do come up with something and uh, and that and, and and get this started so that we can get something in in, in uh, place I've gone through it uh, I don't see anything glaring in it and that that you know there may be some tweaking but I think if we start the process which we are seem to be be working on now uh, it can always be amended but I think we should get going on it I, I support uh, and that Councillor Bridgman Councillor Hayes um, just a matter of procedure. This document, the proposed um, policy directions, uh, we're working with the district on this. So has this been presented to district? And if they have, have they commented on it? No comments or no comments yet? No comments. So, so. I think they'd probably take direction more from this council okay. to the district committee. So. All right. And then a uh, follow up question. Are there any areas in here, I know that this is a proposed policy, but are there any um, any areas in here that are finalized that we could make comment on today? Because I don't want to make comment on something that's moving because you may be wasting your time. But if something is fixed and that's what you're proposing, nothing's ready to go yet? Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, certainly. Uh, we had a presentation at the district council, and that for the uh, the community and planning services, it was an excellent presentation. It was a, basically the same one that, that that Jim Lewis gave us, and he was on holidays, but they had somebody and they did it excellent, and it was well received. I think so. The working on it. Okay, Councilor Bridgman. Just a, a request. I think this sounds great. Could we ask that this come back to council in November? And the reason I'm asking that is then they'll have their direction from that council meeting on on how to structure the OPA. Yep, and well, and Committee of the Whole can definitely make a, make a recommendation to council anyway, so. Um, uh, but absolutely, it would be coming directly to council. Yeah. So okay. from the screen. Thank you. Um, okay, so our CEO is just working on some general language here, I think, to capture the uh, discussion around the table. Um, I do want him to just double check with our director of planning on that before we sort of put it on the table, if that's okay. So I'm going to suggest maybe just a five minute break and then we'll come back. Thanks.
Committee of the whole, represented by council. <laughs> okay. I apologize uh, for the delay. Thank you to Mr. Weirs, Mr. Pink, um, Mr. Hammond, and uh, everyone for getting here. So, those in the public, just to understand sort of where we're going. Um, Part of the concern is that we just start pulling policy and direction out of the air based on council without really staff's input as to where we need to go. So the idea is really to have our staff do a more fulsome evaluation of the Manette Steering Committee interim recommendations. And out of that will be some specific questions that council may have to answer. I'm using Phil language here of what's about to be done. Uh, at which point we will evaluate that and we will answer those questions or do the best job we can in two weeks at our next council meeting and then be able to direct staff from there to start to develop some policy around this. So I have a resolution moved by Councillor Nishikawa, seconded by Councillor Hayes. Be it resolved that staff be directed to review and evaluate the Manette Steering Committee interim recommendations and that staff report back on the results of that review together with any outstanding questions or concerns at the November 13th, 2019 Council meeting. Any comments or questions? Councillor Jagowitz. Uh, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> the email that we received from, uh, from the clerk's office indicated that there were two things that were going to occur at this meeting. One was to ask for a staff report and the other was to initiate a, uh, a draft uh, official plan. What, what happened to the second part? Uh, I, I'm happy, Councilor Bridgman, if you want to chime in. I think the reality is what our, our discussion, if I may, that um, David needs some specific answers on some questions to be able to start drafting plan and policy, and yet we don't have his full comments on the interim report so we're a little bit putting the cart before the horse and the idea being in our December meeting or sorry in our November meeting we would answer some of the questions that David I mean he can think of some stuff on the fly but is it a service community and unservice community directs policy in vastly different directions so for him to say go forward one direction um, and for those who weren't in the discussion I am not in any way shape or form prepared today to say serviced or not serviced without some background, some information, some reports, some justification, that's just my free will. Um, and I need to evaluate and get a staff recommendation to either support or deny that. Frank? Yeah, and I support the staff recommendation, uh, clearly. All I asked was some direction as to when uh, we would expect a draft OPA, for example. Well, not that's that's it. So we're going to be directing him, so the idea and the goal right now would be to come back, we'll evaluate and confirm that. Uh, in two weeks, but probably in December is the plan that hopefully David can meet that deadline. But depending on what questions we can answer or not answer necessarily, <laughs> it might not be December. Um, it, it's just this is the next step in the process, and the goal, as everyone, is to have this uh, on the table in December. If I could, uh, Chair Harding, um, yes. Yeah, so, so um, Councillor Jagowitz would in our discussion. There's the the. Um, piece of paper that you handed out with your six points. I encourage everybody to look at that. I think it really gets your thought process going because we really have to think hard about it. So when um, David comes back in November, uh, what I said, and I agree completely with, with Mayor Harding, is before that December meeting when we have, when November we will direct to have our, our draft OPA in December, we may want to meet a week before just to to be able to talk about it and thrash it out so we're sure we can pass it in December. So that is my, because David's going to come back in November with, with thoughts and recommendations and it may take us a couple of weeks to get through that. So my thought is, depending on how the November meeting goes, we may want a meeting be in between then and December to be able to clarify everything. So again, a lot of that will come out based on our, in two weeks from now, David will have a more clear idea of where we're going to go. So, so it's just a, when do we expect to get a draft official plan for our review? The target is December Council meeting. Thank you. Okay. So you've all heard the resolution. All those in favor? That is carried. Thank you. David, you're clear? <laughs> 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 do you like how we uh, diverted that? Okay. 
I have a resolution moved by Councillor Mazan, seconded by Councillor Hayes. Be it resolved that committee of the whole adjourn at, what's that, 358 p.m. And the next meeting of committee of the whole will be held at the call of the chair. All those in favor? That is carried. Thank you.